Good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8. Um, so if you have a Bible, open up to Acts chapter 8. And if you don't, uh, some of the folks back there will give you a Bible. You just raise your hand. For the folks tuning in online, if you need a Bible, let us know. We'll mail you one. We won't even charge shipping or handling. We're just really gracious that way. Actually, we aren't. You can send us some money. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so Acts chapter 8. This has been in our anchored reading series right now where uh, I think uh, Acts 8 and Leviticus 12, I don't know. but I've been going through Acts as far as the study is concerned, and one of my favorite passages um, is with Philip when he uh, is used of a Lord to have the Ethiopian eunuch come to Christ who was the treasurer for Candace. I love that passage. I was getting excited about it. And then I was talking to Michael last night. He was getting ready to teach the Saturday night service. And he's doing the one o'clock. And he said he's teaching that passage. So I, <laughs> I'm a little heartbroken. No, <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I jumped ahead of him to the story before that one. Um, and, and I'm going to make his sermon at one o'clock really difficult to give because I'm going to, no, I'm kidding about that too. <laughs> I like, I like Acts chapter 8. There's some really profound pictures for the church and things that you face in your Christian walk. And Philip is such a wonderful character to follow in the scriptures because he, he just moves wherever God tells him to go. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And he, he does exactly that. He just goes as the Lord leads and it's really sweet. Uh, before we begin with the study, I just want to share with you one last thing. Uh, we were, I think it was, we, we were in Acts 3, we were talking about the, the Lord healing and uh, going through passages of scripture there. And at the end of the service, uh, we had some folks come up for prayer and I, I would receive a number of calls of folks who were blessed and healed of many of the remedies, uh, ailments, I should say not remedies, ailments, uh, maladies, ailments. And, but one in particular I was really excited about is I was leaving this service, the 11 o'clock service. I was deeply moved. I was um, just rejoicing and thanking the Lord for a sweet day. And my wife called me and she said, um, you're, you are going to go over to the hospital and, and pray for my mom, right? I said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to do. I was going to drive over there. I was going to take a nap, but then I'm going to know. But that's not what I, the Lord wanted me to go to the hospital. <laughs> that's how guys hear from the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I drove, I drove over there and my mother-in-law had been in the hospital over, gosh, 50 days. And she's, she's been, she's been fighting. She's tough as nails. And I went over there and anointed her with oil and I prayed for her and she had watched the service and she just, it, it, it was just a, a sweet countenance about her. Uh, the next day the doctor came in and said, you're going home. I mean, and she's home now after 50 days. So it's sweet. And the scripture says it's the gift of healings, not of healing, meaning you don't, you don't get to uh, be used of the Lord to heal everybody. It's just healings in your instrument. And the reason why you use the oil is you want to put the focus on the one who gets the credit, and that's the Lord. Uh, I, I went in there, and, you know, I'm, I'm anointing her head with oil, kind of, well, that's what you're supposed to do, so here we go, you know. And, and she's been dealing with this, and, and you anoint their head with oil, and you pray. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's kind of like, was it... Um, Rhoda, when, when there's a knock at the door and it's Peter, and they'd all been praying for his deliverance, and she goes back, Peter's at the door, like, no, he isn't, are you crazy? But you're praying for it, and you, he's at the door. No, he's not, it's like an apparition. I'm the folks in the house, I'm like, well, okay, let's pray, because that's what God wants us to do. And maybe all of you are like, super God of faith, I'm moving, and watch me change the world. Okay, good for you. I... <laughs> I love to be amazed by the Lord, and I was, I was completely blown away this week by how I watched the Lord move in your life, and I know it had nothing to do with me, it had everything to do with him, uh, and when we avail ourselves and just step where God wants us to step and say what God wants us to say and do what God wants us to do, God does what he can only do, and it was really sweet, so amen, God's good. And one last thing before we jump in, um, I got a text from uh, a friend who I've been ministering to and I love and, and they're, they're going through a rough time right now. And you know, they, we've, I've walked with them through good times, rough times, some really bad times. 
And I got a text last night, and I was kind of cracking up at the text because I know that they're, they're going through it. And this is what the text said. Why does God put us through hell on earth? And I'm, I'm sitting with my wife, and you, know, this is a, you want a deep theological response to that? Why does God put us through hell on earth? And I thought, he doesn't. We do. Now, I don't know if that was a loving thing to do, but it's true. God doesn't put us through hell on earth. He brings heaven through the hell that's on the earth. And he uses us as instruments to do the same. And, and it's perspective. And you know why you write something like that? Why does God put us through hell on earth? Is because God's not playing by our rules or doing things the way we want him to do it. And I have watched a number of people in my Christian life walk away from the Lord because God didn't play by their rules. They just quit the game and left with their baseball bat and their ball and they went home. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, somewhere along the line, I guess God died and you became God. And you're, you're gonna set the standard and the direction for what God wants to do. And, and you, you don't need his counsel or his wisdom. God doesn't, God doesn't put us through hell on earth. God uses all things together for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even the pain in this life is used together for good. We're instruments of righteousness. My life is not my own. I've been crucified with Christ. We're instruments of righteousness to bring healing to a broken world that is systemic in sin. And we yield our lives to serve. And then we get to witness as God moves in the affairs of men and we get to be an instrument of that, that purpose. But then when, when you think it's about you and, and you, you've des designed what life is supposed to be and God doesn't play by your rules or dance when, when you, you grind the, the, the musical organ and think he's your circus monkey or your cosmic genie, you get upset and you say, you know, I'm attributing this as acts of God, like insurance companies. What are those acts? That the sun rises and the sun sets and the tides move and flow and birds migrate, babies are born, humans are knitted together in the womb of their mother, the intricacy of DNA and the way that God, no, 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 acts of God, pestilence, famine. Wait a minute, I, I thought that famine, pestilence is a result of what man does to man. Starvation, you, you, you see Somalis dying as they're in, the warlords intercept the food that's given by countries that, that have a Christian principle. You see people who are driven by profit as opposed to, to, to moral conviction selling weaponry to destroy mankind. You're watching as people play with the DNA of humanity and inject them with experiments. And then pestilence strikes and we're going to blame it on God. No, it's the absence of God and the morality that governs our life. We don't get to get to a place where we're playing around with those things that God doesn't want us to do and blame him for it. Right. It doesn't work that way. And through the course of life, you'll walk in this world and you'll see Christians who walk with God or you'll see people who appear to be Christians who walk with God and one day, and it's happened on a handful of occasions in my 30 plus years with the Lord, where I'm stunned that that person never believed. And this is Simon that we're going to see. So, so profound is this man that the English language gives him a word that has been used for thousands of years and it's attributed to him. And so with that brief introduction, let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 8, I'll begin at verse 1. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently. Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is Stephen. They stoned him. Stephen gave a profound sermon, and it was his only sermon, his last sermon, and they killed him. Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced, practiced sorcery in the city and was astonished and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of one of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Now the Phillips translation, it's a powerful translation. It's, it's translated to hell with you and your money. Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You've neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Lord, we ask your blessing on the study of your word. Lord, to think that Simon would be poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Lord, that's mankind, but why would he portray himself to be something he was not? God, Open our eyes to the Simons of the world and then open our eyes to the Phillips and the Johns and the Peters of the world that we would know the truth, that the truth would set us free. God, I pray your blessing upon the study of your word. Please, Lord, lead us into all truth. We ask this, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a seat if you would. So, the English word attributed to Simon the sorcerer. Simon's an interesting character. The word attributed to him is called simony, buying or selling of something spiritual or closely connected with the spiritual. More widely, it's a, any kind of contract of this kind is forbidden by divine or ecclesiastical law. The name is taken from Simon Magus, which, you, Magus, it, which is who endeavored to buy from the apostles the power of conferring the gifts of the Holy Spirit. How are gifts conferred upon people, not by man, but by God? 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith, and by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings, and by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, and to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as God wills, he wills, not man. Man doesn't confer these gifts. And who is this Simon the sorcerer? Verse nine depicts it. 
Verse nine of chapter eight of Acts, there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great. Well, what do we know about Simon? He's a man of pride. Pride was the first sin. I will be like the most high, Lucifer said. He's God's most beautiful angel. Pride. Pride is, in a sense, the root of the very first sin that entered the world. Pride. It's fascinating that we have the entire month of June not dedicated to the 80th anniversary of those that stormed the beaches of Normandy and the cliffs of Duhok to deliver all of Europe from the grasp of tyranny. No, no, we give that a day, maybe. We dedicate an entire month to pride, Pride Month. We desecrate the rainbow of, of God's sign to mankind. We ascribe to each color of that rainbow no longer God's faithfulness. We subscribe to it sexual preference and we take the entire month of June to celebrate a, a person who takes their I entire identity and myopically and truncated defines themselves by one small aspect, their sexual preference. Their deviance, they want to celebrate that, not for a day. For an entire month, all corporations must embrace it or be canceled. All cities must have parades and raise flags. We're watching in LA as stations, fire stations, individually are contending and fighting back and pushing back and I'm impressed with those young captains. The only flag that should fly over City Hall or any government facility should be the American flag and that's it. And, and the state flag for which it represents and you can have a city flag if you'd like. But that's it. That's it. That's it. There, there's, there's not going to be this celebration of sexual preference. There, there's not going to be story hour. We're watching as these, these pride parades are dwindling across the country. Maine was the hotbed for pride parades throughout those little hamlets and towns in Maine in this season where the weather is beautiful, the bugs are not too many, and it's, it's that one season in Maine where you can enjoy it and you're not on the verge of death by freezing. <laughs> and you, you go out to enjoy your little town or hamlet and they're all marching down in their perversion and your children are left, and they've, they've had enough. And now as they're looking at each of these different hamlets, what was once a crowded community, they have now rejected it and the, the cities are barren of these parades. It's happening across the country. It's come to a place where, where common citizens, we, we've, we've given enough and, and, and we've, we've been patient enough and, and now we, we will not be bullied anymore. And, and we're watching that as it's occurring. Now I say that because pride, pride. Claiming that he was someone great, pride. We don't celebrate pride. It's, it's not what, what God would want or desire us to do. And yet here we have Simon, Simon the sorcerer. And it opens by pointing out that Saul consented to his death, and we read that first sentence, we say, what, what death was he consenting to? The death of Stephen. You see, Stephen and Philip were buddies. They were friends. They were brothers in Christ, and they were chosen by the other apostles to wait tables when there was a dispute between the, the separate groups of, of widowers. And the, the Hebrew widows and, and the Hellenistic widows, and, and they... They allowed them to wait tables and to care for them. And, and so they, they picked Hellenists, they picked Greeks, and they picked Philip, and they, they picked Stephen. 
And Stephen is, is serving and his, his, his sermons are his actions. And he's beloved. And now when the church is being persecuted, Stephen, 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 Stephen stands up and gives his, his first sermon and his last sermon because they killed him. And he gives this unbelievable sermon where he's proclaiming the history of the Jewish people and he's calling them to repent. And then they, they just are infuriated. So they stone him, they tie him to a post in his hands and they throw stones, big giant stones at his face and he can't protect himself and they're crushing his body. And to get a good run and a good throw in, they had these robes with the, the long cuffs and they were hard to throw because they'd catch wind and you couldn't really hit somebody with it. So they'd take off their outer garment and they'd roll up their sleeves so they could really give them a whack with that thing. And they didn't want to put their coat on the ground, so they'd go over and they put it in the arms of the man that was holding the coats, consenting to everyone killing Stephen. And that was a man named Saul, who would later become Paul. Paul would live with the picture of Stephen looking to the Lord, radiant and joyful in the midst of the misery of a death so brutal. And there'd be no fear. And Saul's entire life was enveloped by fear, fear, fear of failure, fear, fear of not fitting into a society where the rules and the regulations were so stifling and overwhelming. And he saw in Stephen freedom he held the cloaks. And you say, well, he never threw a stone. He wasn't guilty of his death. Yes, he was. Consent is achieved by silence. Yes. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything when they murdered him. And the passage begins, Saul consenting to his death while he held the coats. And what does it do? It creates a great persecution and arose against the church, which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. I was... Mindful of Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and all Judea. And now it's going into Samaria and the ends of the earth. Why? Because they're being persecuted. Persecution is to the church what wind is to a seed. When the church isn't persecuted or challenged, it becomes lethargic and cowardice. But when it's persecuted, it grows. And here they're being persecuted by a man named Saul. Saul who would one day yield to the power of the bride of Christ and give his life to the Lord and become an instrument of planting churches and pastoral epistles that would, would culminate in the book you hold in your hand. With the exception of Luke, he was the most prolific writer of the New Testament. His writings have a have established the order of the church and he's been used of God in so many profound ways. But at this moment, he's not being used of the Lord, but God is still using the persecution together for good, but he has no interest in serving God. He made havoc of the church. This is an ancient Greek word that could refer to an army destroying a city or a wild animal tearing at its meat. He viciously, viciously attacked Christians, including women. He was a coward. They were scattered everywhere and they preached the word. I love what Stott says. He says a statement that they preached the word is misleading. And you go back into the Blue Letter Bible and you look at Strong's exhaustive concordance and you break down that statement, he's right. The statement that they preached the word is misleading the Greek expression does not necessarily mean more than they shared the good news. They proclaimed what Christ had done. They didn't know, all of them didn't know deep philosophies. They were just standing boldly on what they did know. They were still growing in their understanding, but they weren't paralyzed that you can't speak unless you understand soteriology and, 
eschatology and hermeneutics and you don't even know what the words are. It doesn't matter. You know Jesus and what he's done for your life. You testify to that and lead others to him. And so they're preaching this word and they're proclaiming it. All the while Paul's making havoc and he's devouring and tearing apart Christians as though they were, they were prey devoured by wild animals. And as a result, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed, and the lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. I love this idea of great joy in that city. They, they, they stood boldly and they proclaimed Christ in such a, a, um, a lovely way Philip did. But where, where did that come from? Great joy in the city. He walked into the city days ago witnessing his friend killed, murdered by Saul, who's, who's devouring Christians, and he has to leave to go to Samaria. Samaria! 750 years earlier in Samaria, Jews, Jews exited, and, and it was the rich and the middle class and the impoverished stayed, and they mingled with, 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 a, with pagan cultures. They built their own temple, they, they pseudo-practiced Judaism, and they were despised by Jews, they were considered half-breeds, Jews couldn't stand them. They didn't even want so much as the shadow to pass by them as they walked down the street. And now Philip comes into this city heartbroken to testify to people his entire life he was told to disdain and hate. And what does the Spirit of God do upon this man's heart? As a servant, he loves them. And great joy falls upon this city. Stephen, whose life is burdened by the death of his friend, comes into the town and God uses his yieldedness with signs and wonders and it gives this impressive confirmation to the truth that he proclaims. The people find Jesus in the midst of all of it as Philip preaches and great joy comes into that city. Why was there so much fruit? You just simply have to go back to John chapter four, when Jesus needs be, went down to Samaria and met a woman who had multiple lovers. And Jesus knew of her life, her sordid life, and ministered to her. And she went in and proclaimed, I have met a man who told me everything about my life. Her life was profoundly affected and she began to proclaim this God she scattered the seed that Philip walked into and it was this rich awakening. As Jesus would be crucified, the church would be born, they would be baptized in Acts chapter 1-8, power of the Holy Spirit be upon them and now Philip walks into Samaria no longer racist and no longer prejudiced and no longer hurting in the sense that he would, would allow his life to be smothered by bitterness or be poisoned by bitterness he would see Stephen's life as a martyr's death to sow seed of hope. And he'd walk in to the fertile soil that Jesus had already prepared when he met the woman at the well. This is a profound work as Philip would reap that harvest and great joy would fall upon that city by the miracles that God did through Philip. I'm moved by that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul would write, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And Philip understands, this isn't my life. I don't count it dear to myself, as Paul would write. He walks into Samaria. He'll go anywhere God tells him to go. The steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. We don't get to dictate. Our life is not our own. God purchased it with his blood upon the cross. John 10, Jesus says, no man takes my life. I willingly lay it down. I died for you. He has been placed in my hand. No one can remove. I and my father are one. 
that you may know you have eternal life. I've given you eternal life. This is John 10. It's powerful. Jesus would say in John 15, for those who would walk with him, those who would be inspired as you're witnessing with Philip to just be used and go wherever God's telling you to go. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Pausing for emphasis. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As Jesus would say in the book of Acts, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, where they are now in the outermost parts of the world, that the apostle Paul, who is now Saul, would be used of God. God is going to shape mankind and redeem them by men and women completely surrendered to him. And the two things you can never say in your Christian walk is no God. No, Lord. He's either Lord or he isn't. He's either God or he isn't. And all we say to him when he commands is yes. And you go. And Philip goes. Philip goes. I'm moved by this. But for some of you, we're coming into a troubling period in this text. It's troubling. Paul would write in his second epistle to the church at Corinth. He would say, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith and test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. I, I love you, Lord but I don't want to do that. Oh, no, I, I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, strength. My, I love the Lord. Why does he make me go through hell? Why do you do this to me? What do you love about God when he's your benefactor and your cosmic genie and your circus monkey? That's the question I ask myself in those times where I complain like I just described. I'm, I've got you all beat if you're wondering if I'm picking on you. I don't prepare sermons for you. I don't enjoy putting them together anymore. You enjoy listening to them. I was reading this last night. God Use Galatians 6, verses 7, 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I'm, I'm moved by that because I watch as, as people sow to the flesh and then, and then life implodes and they blame God for their misery. Oh, no, I, I received the Lord at a ser service. I was at a crusade and I was there. a friend led me to Christ. Yeah. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. What are you reading? Well, I'm not really, I, I, you know, I just don't have time for the Bible. I mean, I love the Lord. Do you? Are you married? Yeah, I'm, I'm married. I'm having a little bit of a struggle, but yeah, I'm married. Oh, good. So your spouse, you ever spend time talking to them? Oh, of course. I mean, you wouldn't have a marriage if you didn't spend time talking. So your relationship with the Lord's kind of the same? I mean, you talk to him, but does he ever talk to you? Because faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. He, he directs your steps. What's he been telling you lately? Of course, you haven't been reading 
because you don't have time for him, though he's the God of the universe who holds the heavens in the span of his hand, who loves you with an everlasting love, who's given you his word that provides faith to allow you to see the world through his perspective and to deal with all the trials so you don't get to a place where everything implodes because you're sowing to the flesh and then you turn to him, the one you profess love for, and say, you're putting me through hell. You sound like a bitter married person. Make sense? It's deeper than that. It's a relationship with the Lord and, and yet we get to a place where we're not to deceive. God is not mocked. Whatever we reap, we sow. The passage goes on, but there was a certain man called Simon. Now what's he reaping? Excuse me, what's he sowing? He's sowing selfishness. Why? Because he's bitter and he's bound in iniquity. There's a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery. And by the way, the term for sorcery in regards to this passage is not someone who can do, you know, magic tricks where they pull their finger off at the joint. You know, it's not that. It's not someone who can do this. It's not that kind of stuff. Or, you know, you juggle with two fingers and you catch it like that. And then you do that and then you can throw and then catch, catch, catch. And that's... Or you, you just put them in there and bring them out here. It's, you're, I mean, you're going, ooh, I need to bow to that. He's amazing. And that's why they call me nothing. And that's, <laughs> that's not the source we're talking about. This is drug-induced. This is, this is where you're seeing apparitions and, and, and where you can channel yourself. You can go to another dimension. You, you, you find as your mind is open and hallucinogenic that possession takes place and you can't distinguish between the word of God and, and Satan and you, confusion envelops you. And then all of a sudden you, 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 make, a, you make a bargain and you find that you've, you've been given authority and power. And, and, you, and you, you see that people say, this is a man of great power. Fame envelops you. You become an idol. And, and you enjoy walking into a room as they recognize your significance. Mm, yes, it's about time. And these mood-altering drugs, whatever power Simon had, it wasn't of God. It was solely of Satan. The wording in the Greek defines... Simon was a magi. You remember in Matthew 2 where the magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know that there were three, but because there were three gifts, we assume there, but they would travel in large packs. They were the strongest influence in the Middle East at this time. They existed in a world where when they came face to face with Christianity, they either would destroy it or be destroyed by Christianity because they, they held captive the minds of people by their parlor tricks and drug use. And all of a sudden on the scene of this, this man who's practicing sorcery in the city and he's astonishing the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great. He's claiming he's great. This is pride and, and he's... He's amazing people in the city. And all of a sudden in this amazement where his stock is, is risen and he's got a corner on the market and everyone's giving him heed from the least to the greatest saying, this man is, he's the embodiment of the great power of God. Whew. That's problematic And they heeded him because he'd astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. And you start to, I mean, I, I see folks in Hollywood who come to Christ and I, I, I see people, I, I see people complain that when their musical career is coming to a close, they then repent and come to the Lord. I don't got a problem with that. Because in the midst of it, they can't tell the beginning from the end and they have to see that the tinsel and the bells and the whistles and the baubles and the trinkets 
and, and the deception starts to fade. You can't keep the smoke and mirrors and the plates spinning. And when you're getting old, they can't make you relevant anymore. And they just usher you into the retirement home of, of the actors. And then you start to realize, what was that? I watched a series of Bon Jovi and he had to get his vocal cords redone so he could sing at a quarter of what he was singing before. And I'm watching Bruce Springsteen. I think he's getting into his late seventies and he's still doing these concerts. He can't, he's getting the audience to sing for him. But there are those times where you're, you're getting to the end. What's it all about, Alfie? What do you, what do you, what's life? And you're getting to the end and you're thinking yourself that person, but you're looking in the mirror going, ah, you are really old. And it's hard to move your face at all the things that's happened to you. You know what I'm saying? And you, you, you come to the end of yourself and there God meets you. For a rich man, that doesn't just mean wealth, it means rich in fame. To go to heaven is like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. That's not a gate, and it's, it's, an, it's, it's that. It's like impossible, but all things are possible with God. But he brings you to the end of yourself. I don't have a problem with a Johnny Cash's of the world coming to Christ at the end. That's okay with me. Oh God, please let him get to heaven. I, I hope on the toilet as he was dying, of drug overdose that Elvis gave his heart to the Lord, returned back. I don't know. I, I, I would wish that my, my worst enemies would come to know the Lord. But he is so consumed by the intoxicating power of astonishing people and the, and the, the power you hold sway over others. I mean, that's the hard thing. God is, God is gracious. He takes, he takes these rock stars. I mean, Mick Jagger. It's like Skeletor. And he, you know, to his credit, he's, he's, his career's gone decades. Generationally, the same thing with Springsteen concerts. You got great grandkids with great grandpa. And they're singing songs and liking that. And yet, I, I look at a guy like Mick Jagger, and all these women were just enamored with him. He wasn't good looking. <laughs> he had fame and money. And, and the songs he played moved generations as the Beatles. And, and now they get to a place where they're old and it... it it's like the nothing that the world offers can I even process anymore. My stomach, I have, I have indigestion. My knees, I can't, I can't sing. I don't sleep well. Not, nothing the world has is pleasant anymore. They used to get everything they wanted at the time, where, but their body has just been riddled. Drugs don't even help. Just awful. And, 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 and is it, they, they, they miss the, the chance to captivate people. And that's, that's Simon. He has an entire nation that's moved by him and his sorcery. He has great power and they, they attribute it to God, but it needs to be God with a small g. Almost finished, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Philip has no ability of miracles. We read that in, in 1 Corinthians 12. Philip is just an instrument of God doing what he pleases, and God gives gifts as he desires, and Philip is yielded. You're going to see, as, as, as Micah will share, or you can read in the Anchored series in the, in the next story that, that he, he, he's told to go a route no one ever takes and runs into the treasurer for Candace of the Ethiopians and, and shares the Lord with him, an Ethiopian eunuch. And he, and he baptizes him right there and then he's gone. And the eunuch goes into Ethiopia and you, you get to hear all, all of these triggered anti-Christian leftists who say, you know, 
Christianity is a white man's construct and, and, and it's, it's a colonialist religion. You are an idiot. Have you not heard of the Ethiopian eunuch? Christianity was in Egypt, or excuse me, Ethiopia, long before it was ever in Western Europe. And, and they'll say that to you. Ethiopians will look at, at white, you know, angry youth who have, have bought a hook, line, and sinker without doing any education and believe everything they've said, not testing a word of it, and they'll say it, and next to them, and I've watched these memes, these Ethiopian you know, students that have, have come to the United States look and say, no, Christianity was in Ethiopia long before it was in Europe. Oh, but we just dismiss that because it doesn't fit our narrative. I don't know what the point of that was, but it's super cool. <laughs> it's super cool that Philip is just yielded to what God wants to do. He's, he's just yielded. And no matter what Simon's trying to do, he, he can't possess the power Philip has. And he's preaching and people are willingly being dunked in water and associating with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And miracles are happening. And he's like, I want that. Everyone you're touching is weeping and their lives are changing and relationships are being healed and sickness is being delivered. This is a lame people are walking. I need this. I need you to give this to me. And, and, and Simon is baptized. It says, the scripture says he believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. I'm walking with him. And he was amazed. And he saw the miracles and the signs. And then this happens. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, this is, this is problematic for those who don't believe in a secondary baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you're, you give your heart to the Lord, you receive Christ as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit is, is in you. It's three prepositions in the Greek some agree or disagree with. Christendom is divided over it. Para is the first Greek word, parallel lines. They're alongside each other. The Holy Spirit is para. He is alongside all mankind. He's a restrainer of evil, and he's pointing people to Christ. He comes in you when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence. You become a new creature in Christ. And then para is what you see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and what you're seeing here in Acts chapter 8, that he comes upon you, overflowing this dunamis power, where you have the giftings of the Holy Spirit. You can't take 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of the Spirit, and say that they died with the apostles. You have to do yourself into a pretzel to state that with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God does, it's on the cessationist. Some of us are afraid of the abuses of the Simons of the world. I get it. And you want the simony. You want to profit from it. And I get it. We see it every day as people are abusing it on television and everywhere else across the country and the world. And it's sickening and it's frustrating. But in the same regard, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. These are gifts. Philip is enjoying them. Simon is abusing them. And he wants this power. And as they've received the Holy Spirit, it's interesting. Peter and John, Peter and John come down. Peter and John are apostles. They come down to Samaria, and as they get down there, both of these witness the crucifixion of Christ. It was John who was in the presence of the Lord, and Peter at a distance warming himself by a fire when he had said to the Lord, I will, I will go to prison, I'll even die for you. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll betray me three times. It was John who said, I, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he wrote that about himself. And these, these two are so moved. And, and, and Peter, of all people, Peter, he's the one who said in, in Matthew 16, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this. You're my Father in heaven. Y you, you heard from my Father. And then the next chapter, he's like, get behind me, Satan, because he, he totally blows it and he's out of line. And now the rooster's crowing and he's, he's weeping bitterly because he's betrayed the Lord already three times. Peter knows what it's like to be rebuked. And anyone who can discern the human heart is someone who has been called on the depravity of his human heart. And God calls in a big gun, Peter. 
Peter and John come down and they see this revival happening in Samaria and there Simon stands up. They're watching as, as they've received Christ and, and Peter and John lay hands on these folks and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, overflowing, gifts are being manifested, miracles are occurring. And at this moment, it all goes south for one man. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands and the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He offered them money. This is one of those things that's problematic. This is simony. He offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. The sin of Simon was to desire and possess spiritual power for his own personal benefit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Again, Philip's translation, to hell with you and your money. We get so stuck in that. I'm watching in the conservative movement that it becomes money to people. People that you thought would stand shoulder to shoulder with you the minute that the money fades are gone. They, they profess to be with you and following you and all was ever was was a profit margin. It breaks your heart. Christendom, you watch this. And you just think you'd never had any character as a game all along. And they were so good. I mean, I didn't even see it. Philip didn't see it. Why did Peter see it? Because it dwelt in Peter and he was able to understand it. He saw it because it once lived in him. And he sees Simon saying, I, I, I need this gift. I'll purchase it with money. I'll give you money. I just want to have the same power you guys have to lay hands on people. And Peter says, you have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. He goes further. He says, repent, turn. You're going the wrong way, pal. Turn around, repent. Repent, therefore, of this, your wickedness. What, I, just wanted, I just wanted to be able to lay hands on people and watch them, you know, be blessed and be empowered. No, you want to be the author and the controller of their lives. You want to have authority over people. You want to abuse it. How, how would you know that? He says it. Pray God if perhaps the, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned, ready? That you are poisoned, pay attention. You are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. You, you want to do to people what's been done to you your whole life. You went into sorcery to figure out how to do to others what have been done to you. You have been, you have, you, you, you have been bound by another. You've been abused by another. You're bitter by what's happened to you. You wanna do it to others. This victim wants to be the victimizer now. Your heart's wicked. You, you have no desire of repentance. You wanna abuse people. Your innocence was stolen. You want to steal it from others. That's not how God works. Your generational sin can be broken if you'd repent. Your innocence was stolen. You want to take it from someone else. That's called child trafficking and abuse. Well, you don't understand the parents I had. Maybe I don't. I don't even know the parents your parents had. It could be many generations deep. A question for you. Does all that pain, no, oh, why would God put me through hell? He isn't, he's brought heaven to set you free. You just have to come to a place where you have to let it go. But do you understand what happened to me in my childhood? Yeah, God does too. I don't, he fully does. And I'll tell you what, you allow God to lead you out of this and become an instrument, you're going to be used like God used the apostle Peter to figure you out. You're gonna be an instrument to look into the heart of a child whose life has been abused and you'll be able to see it and lead them out so that that poison of bitterness 
and they're being bound by iniquity as they have not allowed their lives to be healed but be used as a victimizer. When's it gonna stop? How much more do we have to perpetrate on mankind and keep blaming God for acts of God? Why does he get the bad rap? We do this to each other. Famine and pestilence. We lie to each other. We hurt each other. We allow children. We're, this poor is bored. What they're doing to kids is unconscionable. And nobody's doing anything. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness. Pray to God that perhaps the father of your heart be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. When we're confronted with that, you know what we want to do? We want to get upset with the messenger. And, and then we cop out if we're unwilling to repent. And we say this little Christianese thing. And I, I want to qualify this because I, I, I tend to be extemporaneous and it gets me in trouble. I, I want to qualify this. People have said this to me and have said this to me for most of my Christian walk and they're gonna say it again. And I'm, I'm not faulting you for saying this to me, but today understand why I'm making an issue of it. I get it when you come or you say to me, pastor, pray for me. I get that. But my first thought is, are you praying for yourself? And if you're praying for yourself, what are you praying for? Because Simon answered when he was confronted with his bitterness and his iniquity. He answered and said, hey, Peter, would you pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me? I don't want the consequences. I, I'm not willing to repent, but would you just pray for me for that? Would you just, would you, would you just pray for me for that? I mean, God's taking me through hell. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're taking yourself through the hell. You're not repenting, but would you just pray for me for that, you're asking? Do you understand how clogged that is? Couldn't Simon say, you know what? I have been the victim of my childhood of misery that has bound me with bitterness, and I'm hurt, and the visions are overwhelming, and, and I have... I have succumbed to being not a victim anymore. I'm a victimizer. I've succumbed to this, and it's wrong, Simon would say. And, and he would say, God, please, would you break this generational curse? Would you help me do what generations before me couldn't do? I'm guilty, Simon would say. Nowhere does he acknowledge why? Because we love the sin. I think that's what's so hard for rock stars. Was it David Cassidy, Partridge family? What, what's that place where you go see concerts over in Agora? Canyon. What? Canyon Club, yeah. And it's like, you know, your last leg you're going through there kind of thing. <laughs> and, and they're just, and, but some of, the, some of them are doing it gracefully, you know, and they're, they're still, they've still got some cool things. And they know. And they're, they're self-effacing humor. I saw David Cassidy there walking through, and I, I, I was so burdened for him. And, and just, to, just to try to talk, forget it. And I contrast that with um, Eddie Money, who I met. I talked to him about the Lord and he was so open and receptive. And then David Cassidy just a short time later would be dead. This is a bit, just not in a place where you want to hear any of that Christian crap. I don't want to do that. He says, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken would come upon me. And then finally, so when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Many people were coming to Christ, but Simon 
we, we find out a little bit about him in church history. Simony, again, is the word for sin of buying or selling church offices or privileges because it's done in the same spirit as Simon. The sin is sometimes practiced today, but more commonly people simply think that blessings, blessing follows money instead of money following blessings. And the great sin of Simon, the sin was a desire to possess spiritual power for personal ends. And, and this is where we this is where we employ the sin of Simon. You say to yourself, I live for God and I try to do what's right and I follow the rules and I shun evil in my life and I live according to God's word. But then tragedy happens and what do we do? We're tempted to cry out to God and we typically do. How could you let this happen to me after all I've done for you? I've tried to live according to your word. Do you will to have this to happen to me? My cosmic genie in the sky didn't do my bidding. My circus monkey, when I ground a musical organ, he didn't dance the way I wanted him to. (laughs) This is my world, and this is my design, and this is what I want, and I have given you. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. Everything's conditional with you. You think God owes you something. He does. And he owes me the same thing. And trust me, you don't want it. (laughs) He's no debtor to any man. Humble yourself. In the sight of the Lord, he'll lift you up. This earth is rapidly passing. And whatever you think is worth compromising in order to abandon what God wants... You couldn't be more wrong. That's Simony, that's the sin of Simon. And Simon is in hell right now, I think, saying, don't do that. Simon says, don't do that. Did you get how I did that? (laughs) I don't know if he's in hell. I don't condemn anyone. That's up to the Lord. It's appointed once for man to die, then judgment. But I do know this. Church history says that Simon became one of the proponents or, or one of the advocates of Gnosticism. He contended with the early church. He was problematic in the early church. And and church tradition says that he was trying to prove that he had sorcery powers and that he had the ability to fly. Well, that didn't work too well. (laughs) You can read about his life, but bottom line, there's a word that describes him, that's simony. You can't buy God off because he doesn't, you don't have anything he wants. No, you don't understand. I've got gold. No, you don't understand. Heaven, that's pavement. And it's already his. And when you die, you're going to let go of your kung, kung fu grip. And it's not yours anymore. I'm going to give it when I die. You give nothing when you die. You give nothing when you die. It's not yours anymore. The only thing you can give is when you're living. And the only, is store your treasure in heaven. The only thing going to heaven is people. And if it's all about you and you want it to further your happiness and your, your whatever, you're Simon. You want to have control over people and you want to use that money to control them and show them. Let it go. Let it go. That's the, that's the beauty of the the early church, they were just not bound by any of that. Freedom. And the last thing is the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Just, if you're bound by guilt or if you're compelled by guilt or compulsion or however that is, it's, it's so it's, it's so binding for a minister to worry about that. Simon wanted it to have power over people. I, 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 don't, I don't care. And I want every pastor to know this across the country. It doesn't matter. I, I don't, the, the wealth of the world may be existing in your pockets. Who cares? Who cares? God's going to do his work on this earth with or without any of us. We either get to participate or we don't. 
but I don't, ha- I, don't, I don't have to raise it or ask for it. it it's almost, it's, it, there's a joy to it. Help me with this because it's going to be misquoted. <laughs> if it, money talks, it's just a matter of when. And I don't, I don't know who anyone, who, what, who gives what, and I never want to know, and I don't, I don't care. I seriously don't care. That's so freeing for a minister. And I've, in, in the 30 plus years, people come up and say, do you know what I've given? No, I don't, and I don't care. <laughs> well, I just, I, you want it back? <laughs> you can leave. I'm, I'm not your employee. You don't order my steps. This isn't a business and I'm not playing it that way. And if you, you wanna push on that, there's been times in my Christian walk where there's, there's been that desire to look at that person who thinks that they have authority over someone because they got a checkbook. And they, you, they, you wanna look at them and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. And I think the Phillips translation says, I was going to say it, but I, I can't say to hell with you and your money because I'd be wrong. <laughs> that was funny, kind of how I just put that in there. <laughs> Seriously, folks, that, that we're bound by the world if we play that game. Let's not be Simonized. Let's serve the Lord. Let's be Phillips. Let's be Peters and Johns. Let's be Samaritans who give their heart to the Lord and serve with reckless abandon. Even if we're the Saul's right now, we're going to repent and one day become Paul's. But the Simons of the world just fall off buildings and they end up in the ash heap of, a, of, of obscurity in the, in the history of the world. Our lives count. May the Lord bless you with that understanding. Live every day of your life with that joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's have the worship team come up. I have to tell you, I get till 12.30 and I finish right at 12.30. So if you go, gosh, she's gone long. Well, okay, tough. They're coming up. They're good time. If you got to use the restroom, hurry to the restroom because the line gets really long. Yeah. Would you stand with me as we worship the Lord? Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the powerful picture of Philip's life, even in the midst of his heartache of losing his dear friend, Stephen, but being obedient to go to Samaria where those that his tribe would consider less than human, that there would be a prejudice, but you, Holy Spirit, would override Stephen, or excuse me, Philip's life and bring healing to his heart over the death of his friend Stephen, and you would give him a love for those his tribe disdained. And you'd make them one in Christ, and then he would have the wisdom to bring Peter and John to come down and discern the waywardness of Simon. That even in the rebuke Peter would experience by Christ, he would be able to see the same fault in Simon's life and minister. And yet, Lord, we watch as you have this ability to take our lives if we're willing to be honest with you. You are merciful with us. And I pray that there be no one trapped in the sin of simony or being simonized, but they would be set free to walk in the fruitfulness of you, Holy Spirit, that you would order our steps and we submit our lives to you afresh. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.